Uh, we're here today about physical and emotional learning environments. And um, it's somewhat, maybe it doesn't fit into your average conference or your average uh, teacher training uh, as much as I would like it to. And that's the reason why I chose it. I had quite a number of topics to choose from, uh, some which would have been more, much more PYP related or IB uh, related. However, I chose this uh, for one reason. Uh, it's very close to my heart. Um, and why? Because I've uh, been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, I've gone uh, through a transformation myself. Uh, from my very early days of teaching uh, to my current position uh, in which I have the opportunity to visit schools all around the world in so many different contexts and no matter what and where this is universally applicable and I think I've come to the realization that before we look at any type of learning that goes on in any school no matter what program uh, no matter under what conditions or where in the world it is, first and foremost, we have to look at the student. And sadly enough, I've also noticed that in my quasi-travels, uh, it's something that we don't always do for many reasons. Uh, the reasons are very varied. They can be simply the personality of the person who's teaching, who actually shouldn't be a teacher, and I'm not including you in this, uh, to uh, educational challenges, national requirements, uh, or the opposite. When you have excellent curricula, uh, the IB programs I, I deem as uh, an example of that, where we are so involved in planning for teaching and learning that we actually don't plan for the student. What comes last is the student. So let's uh, get started. What I want to encourage, or what my objectives are in this workshop, the takeaway, as it was mentioned this morning, the takeaway is continuous reflection and cognition of your practice, to be aware of how you are relating to students. And in line with the theme of the conference, deconstructing and reconstructing the way you think about students and how you work with them. And I'm not as arrogant as to think that uh, what I'm going to show you and talk to you about today is something that you do not do. Uh, so please don't assume that or misinterpret that. Uh, however, I want you to always put the students at the center of everything that you do. What this workshop is not going to do for you is I'm not going to give you handy handouts, regretfully or not. I'm not going to uh, provide you with ready-made tips. I'm not going to provide you with quick solutions to problems. So if there are students in your class who, you, uh, who are what we call uh, attention grabbers, uh, then this is not the workshop that will address those, uh, those needs that you have. Uh, I want to, uh, I want us, and we're a small group, so it'll be easy to do. Uh, I would like us to take one minute to introduce ourselves. I'll start with myself. Um, my name is John Sawyer, and I work for the International Baccalaureate. I, uh, I have a new role as of uh, March 1st, this last, first, uh, last uh, March 1st. I'm now what is called uh, IB Manager uh, for IB World Schools, which is the department for authorized schools um, around the world. I have a portfolio of over 500 schools from uh, northern Canada to Brazil to Norway to South Africa to Australia, New Zealand, China, and the Solomon Islands and everything in between. Uh, and these schools, <laughs> these schools are, uh, uh, ha offer any of our four programs or all of them. So uh, they are very varied. I uh, have been a teacher before. In fact, I have uh, the honor, okay, which is also uh, stressful. No, it's not. But uh, 
uh, apart from being on, on live camera now, I also have uh, the parent of a former student in the audience uh, with me today. Uh, this is Mrs. Avti, and uh, her son was in my class. Uh, yes, uh, he's now. Uh, yeah, so please do not speak with her, okay? <laughs> but. Uh, so, however, um, all of this aside, uh, I used I worked in different schools. I've taught uh, all IB programs and other programs as well, um, in different school settings, international. I started out in in the public sector in Canada uh, at a high school and uh, outside of Vancouver and so on. I then uh, moved into school management. My last school position was as a director of an international school in Poland. Uh, and then I joined the IB as the uh, primary years program uh, regional manager for Africa, Europe, Middle East. And I held that role uh, until very recently uh, where the organization restructured and gave me even more to do. <laughs> so uh, what I'd like you to do now is just to take uh, a minute to reflect uh, and you, what you're going to do, and you don't need to do, do this for everyone, so it's not a, a forced sharing experience now, uh, but what I'd like you to do, uh, at least at your table, so you'll need to join one of the tables, is to give a one-minute autobiography of yourself. It can only be one minute. We don't have more time. So give it uh, just a couple of uh, seconds, 30 seconds maybe to think about it, and then give a one-minute autobiography of you. Okay, can you do that? So I'll give you a little bit of time to think and then you can share it either at your table or you can share it uh, with just one person beside you, okay, or two people beside you. All right, uh, I could probably let you talk for the next uh, 45 minutes, uh, uh, but I won't. Uh, so this, uh, this was a good activity at the time it came because my computer crashed, so I was able to restart it in the meantime conveniently. Hopefully it won't do that again. So why focus on physical and uh, emotional learning environments? Well, I've already uh, mentioned the fact that uh, from my own experiences, I feel that teachers put far too little emphasis on exactly that. Um, and I'll go into uh, physical and emotional learning environments in more detail, of course. But essentially, um, I found, I think the moment that it really hit me was uh, when I was a director at the school in Poland, and we had a one and a half hour staff meeting. It was actually led by uh, teachers who took turns in leading, in leading meetings. Uh, but it, it hit me the realization that we had just spent an hour and a half talking about everything uh, in school except the student. And from there on, um, I realized that this is not the way to go about it. And, and this is uh, essentially uh, one of the greatest problems in terms of uh, the way schools operate and always have. So the way an environment can be defined are the surroundings. And quite often, when we think of an environment, we think of uh, a space, a place. But it's also the conditions which are equally important. So the surroundings and conditions in which a person lives or operates and hopefully thrives. Uh, taking stock, um, take a bit of time to reflect on your own schooling. And what I'd like you to do is recall your classroom or your teachers, whichever is more memorable or maybe both. And then let me know what was most memorable uh, about either. So uh, take two minutes to think about it and then share it maybe at your table, but I'm going to go around. So what I'd like to ask you to do, if possible, is to do this in English, as I myself unfortunately don't have access to Arabic. Uh, that's my own fault. I've never learned it. I should have, uh, especially spend, uh, since I spent a lot of time in the Middle East. Uh, but uh, take some time, go back to your schooling, and think about your schooling, think about teachers that you remember, schools that you remember, buildings, classrooms, okay? And then uh, share it at the table and I'll come around and I'd like to listen as well. Okay. 
Well, that's, that's nice. I couldn't believe that I alone was responsible for that. But all right, uh, we need to move on. Has anyone experienced this? <laughs> All right. Um, what about this? Not as teachers, as a student. You're a student now. Okay. When I when I asked this question uh, to teachers, to educators, uh, I will get both very negative as well as very positive answers and ultimately this is what we remember from our schooling. We will remember our experiences that we recall best are ones that have impacted us most profoundly and they can be either. We will always remember a teacher who has been kind, who has been uh, funny, but who also provided discipline and I don't mean discipline in the sense of a corporal punishment but a structure, but we will always remember those teachers who were what we perceived for some reason extraordinarily mean to us, uh, and we will certainly remember classrooms as well. Uh, so let's talk about the physical environment first. Physical environment refers to the learning spaces, the actual classroom. I hope they're not locking us in. Yeah. <laughs> the actual classroom, uh, but I'm sure we can get out some yeah, here. It's a container. Okay. So, um, quality learning can happen anywhere. And when uh, we talk about positive or attractive learning environments, physical environments, people uh, immediately imagine that these are opulent classrooms with s in schools that have all the resources in the world. But that's not the case at all. Okay. And I've been to schools that have these fantastic facilities, but the learning is really bad. The learning and teaching that happens is really bad. And what's, you know, what, what's the sense or what's the, what's the purpose of having a wonderful learning environment when uh, you don't have good teaching and learning going on? But Quality inquiry learning in particular, or any type of learning, can happen in the most basic of classrooms. Uh, and I've seen it in both conditions. I've traveled in Africa a lot. When I'm in Africa, I also spend a lot of time uh, in government schools, and I work, I've worked with teachers outside of the IB. I've worked with local environments, classrooms where you have 120 students in a class that have nothing. They're, we're not talking desks. There are no desks. They're sitting on the ground. Uh, it's not a floor, it's a ground. And the teacher, if they're lucky, they have a 50-year-old you know, blackboard that's so used and scratched and whether that you can't do much with it. But teachers can create environments that work for or against learning. Uh, and of course, uh, if we had our way, all of us would prefer to have the best resources possible. You know, why would you settle for anything less? But uh, the physical environment or the environment itself has always been, uh, has suggested as being the child's third teacher and we'll go into that as well. Um, beautiful classroom, well, we don't really associate beauty in a classroom. Why? because for as far back as I can remember, classrooms are designed to be functional. In most instances, they're very sterile. Uh, you have to have the structure for discipline so that you can manage, at least that's always been the belief, and to make sure there is compliance and conformity, that students do what they need to do and uh, that you're in charge, because if you can't control them, uh, then they're not going to learn. So, classroom in the 1960s, typical example. Uh, this is in Europe, but it could be anywhere. Please come in, take some photos of us. Uh, um, we move on to a classroom in, the, in 2000. Well, if you look at it, if you look back, uh, apart from that the photo is in color, and it's the year 2000, and you have bright windows uh, that come out better in this picture, 
the actual design, the physical design is the same. We move to 2015, uh, still the same. We move to 2017, uh, again in Europe, this is still the same. Uh, so really, uh, in a changing world, there's been very, very little innovation in classroom design. When you look at the whole picture, I'm not just looking at a few select international schools or, or affluent private schools, but uh, really no change. You still have this model of students sitting in their desk yes. all day long and the teacher standing. Now, you know, some teachers undergo a transformation and as we finally realize as educators all over the world that maybe we're doing something wrong by speaking nonstop and having the kids just sit there and listen all day long, that maybe we need to do something. So what I've seen is that there's a, there's a transformation of the teacher from the kids sitting there and the teacher talking all day long to the kids sitting there and the teacher talking in a more agitated manner or, or you know, just uh, trying to emulate uh, multimedia that they're exposed to uh, for the rest of their life. So why is it that so little change has taken place? I think one of the reasons that I stated already was conformity. You know, we want to be able to control children because if we don't control children, they don't learn. And I don't imply that teachers are mean creatures who hate children and want to control them and discipline them. But, uh, you know, I think the opposite is true. Uh, most teachers are really, really worried that in their class, the child won't learn unless they have these conditions. But that's not the case at all. So sometimes, and again, this is from experiences that I've undergone, uh, in some schools who make this transformation and move from the classroom where it's absolutely sterile, they go do a complete turnaround, a radical change, and what you have are absolutely chaotic environments where there isn't a single piece of paper, a single square millimeter on a wall that's empty. Uh, everything is cluttered uh, for whatever reasons. We have work displayed from the whole year and uh, there are things hanging from the wall plus all the aids that the students have to have, you know, the ABCs to charts to uh, posters which, which talk about positive attitudes, um, all of that, like this, for example. Okay. And I see, I see this kind of classroom many times. My, my ex-partner used to have one like this, uh, <laughs> and we, it was at home like this as well. Maybe that's why we're not together anymore. No, I'm sorry. Uh, or this. Again, Everything is here, it's so cluttered, and I go into IB schools, and particularly PYP classrooms, and I see where uh, in, the, in the PYP there are six units of inquiry per year, in the, in, and four in the very early childhood, and they're all up there. They're all up there. So whatever you've learned, everything is up there. Is this more effective learn? Is this a more effective learning environment? Absolutely not. Because you need to consider the needs of all learners. Think about that child who is distracted for some reason, and many children are, especially when they're younger. So if you're trying to do something in a classroom and you're creating all of this uh, uh, this uh, visual stimuli for children, then uh, it's going to it's, well, it's going, to, uh, it's going to impact them in different ways. Some won't mind it at all, but there will be those who are very easily distra distracted, and I don't like labeling students. So we do a lot with attention deficiency syndrome nowadays. Uh, I think it's much too overrated, and, and it's simply the way that children are growing up these days that impacts that. But uh, if you do have students who need uh, to have a bare wall, or a space in the room that's not cluttered, then uh, you should keep that in mind. So plastering everything on the, on the walls and hanging things off the, off the ceiling 
and having children stumble over everything that you've put in the classroom doesn't necessarily help either. So it's finding that balance between the naked classroom and the overstimulus that uh, is more important. So based on this, uh, I want you to start giving some thought. Now, there's no intention here of going home with your new classroom design and having you busy as you start school and throwing everything out and, and, and because that's, that's not it at all. But I'd like you, uh, and this is pair work, please. Okay, so uh, we are 6, 12, which is perfect. So two people, uh, two people, please. Okay. So how have you or could you design an optimal environment for learning? In the, if you think about it, what are the non-negotiables? What would you have to have in the classroom, in your physical learning environment? And what would be the extras? What would be the value added? Um, how would you go about the redesign? And what are some problems that you might have, some restrictions, some barriers? And what do you think, what physical setting will help your students thrive? And now that last question is a little bit different than this because this is actually focusing you directly on your students. Okay, okay can you take, uh, I just before we, uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce to you the head of uh, primary years program development, uh, Nicole Bien. Uh, so, um, can you get started please? Are there any questions? Okay. Uh, well, everyone else is, so go ahead, yes. I mean, we're, we've got cameras coming in nonstop, <laughs> uh, video recording, so I don't think your, your uh, photos will make a difference, okay? All right, uh, so let's take a couple of minutes to share uh, what you've come up with. Uh, just some examples, what would be some non-negotiables for you uh, in a very uh, effective physical learning environment. Safety, safety. We talked about safety. Yeah. It should be safe. And materials. It should look, uh, address the needs of all students. Plus, uh, to know the challenges of this uh, environment and to uh, uh, to overcome it. To overcome, to overcome it. it. To all right. Yeah. All right. Uh, to have books, books level books. books. Stories. In the digital age, you yes. want books? Yes, okay. yes. still right. books are important. No, that's uh, books, yeah. I'm not going to much so. The actual size, uh, and of course, you know, we are not always able to provide those, but uh, optimally those would uh, definitely be features of a, of a very positive uh, physical learning environment. Anything else? Clean. Sorry? Uh, clean. Clean? Yes. Uh, absolutely. Um, what would be some extras? What would be value added? Uh, I would say technology, uh, FM systems uh, in the classroom to make everything clear for the teacher and, and for, the, for the students. Uh, and we wrote uh, educational materials as well. Okay. I think probably if we had an outing that they can straight away go to nature and do that experimentation. They have a very close library that they can use that, those facilities so easily without really needing that monitoring of the school the teacher and preparing them to go to the library or preparing them to go and play or experiment or investigate. Um, it would be fantastic. And I've seen schools where they have that opportunity where you're, you, know, you open the classroom door and you're in nature or you're, you can actually make use of more than just the confines of the classroom. Yeah. Anything else? That's it. I have some. Okay. Um, the seating, like if we can put uh, like bean bags or like couches in the classroom, if we have space, like we don't want the, the formal seating all the time because some students who are very active, maybe this is the way they'd like to sit and read in a not formal setting. Um, barriers, what Bad. might be some restrictions? Budget. Budget. <laughs> Always budget, budget. yes. Space. Type of space. 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 space.
size of furniture. Centers? What do you notice here? Well, not too much right now, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, hopefully the sound won't be too bad, too loud. I've tried to control it, but the speakers tend to be, okay. but just look at this classroom and tell me what you notice, okay? recognize this okay. <laughs> yes this is one class from here yeah but that's not I'm not okay just tell me what you notice about the classroom so uh, but you can't say anything Did you notice anything spe specific? Sorry? Uh, no, it doesn't actually. It doesn't. It looks like home. That it does, and you're right about that. Uh, you're right about that. Anything else that you noticed? Everything that is displayed is child's work. Yes. There's no teacher. Look again, very carefully. Maybe, maybe. Okay, I'll rephrase it. What's missing? <laughs> well, the students are not in session, but. Uh, There are desks, yeah. Uh, yes, but uh, I rephrased the question, what's missing? Well, I'm going to have to help you here for what the most, uh, ultimately something that you will always notice when you walk in the classroom teacher. in most schools. Well, the teacher is out with the students, hopefully, uh, or someone is out with the students, but what's lacking here is this. This is what's lacking. It's not just a teacher's desk. I refer to them because I've seen so many versions of this and I'm guilty of this in my own teaching. What you see is not a teacher's desk. It's the kingdom, kingdom of the of teacher. The teacher. <laughs> because ultimately, that's what the classroom tends to be. And while you notice that students have half a desk space, <laughs> teachers are able to sprawl out uh, and bring you know, they, they usually have a bookcase, they have a desk, they have the best computer. If it's the only computer, they have the best computer, even if it's meant for the whole class, it's the teacher who uses it. Um, and not only that, but they also are able to personalize it. 
So you have family photos, you have travel photos, you have certificates, all of that is there. And this is lovely, but how inviting is that for the student who spends the entire day in the classroom as well uh, to have a confined little space and the teacher is coming in and, and creates uh, opulence. Well, you know, you could argue, but I'm the teacher, I spend more time, I'm in charge of everyone, I need my reference materials, I need this. Yes, uh, and you can have that, but it doesn't all A, need to be in the classroom, nor uh, do you need to personalize it. And I'll, I'll explain a little uh, more uh, about this later. Um, so, optimizing the physical environment, uh, you do not need to run to school, back to school now, to get a degree in interior design. <laughs> That's not a necessity. Um, but what you need to focus on is what is aesthetically appealing that has value, because you and the students are going to that classroom every single day. And that is not restricted to uh, schools who have a lot of resources or general resources because aesthetic appeal can be defined in many ways uh, and it was a set already and somebody preempted uh, what I'll be getting at later ultimately it's do with uh, what you can what you're able uh, anything is better than just having sterile rooms or setting up you know a quarter of the room a quarter of the room uh, for yourself uh, and the rest for the students. Okay. Some suggestions, and they do not need to be expensive. Plants in most places are not expensive. Uh, and uh, my former student's parent will probably tell you that I had a number of plants in my room. Uh, but they, they do add a a more comfortable, a more appealing environment. Uh, lamps, if you can, to soften lighting. What's more important, we talked about movement, but it's also a variety of tables, ideally tables that you can stand at. And avoid clutter. It's what I, what I talked about in terms of the, the learner uh, and some students who uh, do not react well to uh, too much stimulus. And this variety of tables, if you can, and again, this doesn't need to be expensive, find someone to make them. Uh, they can be made with simple wood, and it's just a table with simple wood where children can stand at. Just imagine if you had to go quasi to work every day, sit down somewhere for five to six hours to seven hours and stay in that seat and as soon as you actually get out of it sit down <laughs> every single day just imagine if you had to do that is that the kind of environment where you live at home is this your home environment or do you actually move around do you have different you may have this kind of chair but you might have a sofa I'm not implying that you need to put sofas into the classroom but Areas that are comfortable for different types of learning, uh, quiet areas where you where people can withdraw. That kind of thing. And one example, and, and the video I showed you was from the Qatar Academy. I was there a couple of weeks ago, as well as this. Something as simple as this, which is a nice idea. Uh, it's not. I don't think it costs an arm and a leg. Well, in most places it doesn't at least. Uh, and I'm not saying you should all run out now and get some, get some tree stumps. That's not the idea. But uh, look, at, uh, look at possibilities. And I just wanted to share the approach that a group of teachers had in uh, the Qatar Academy. And I've, I've uh, experienced this in a couple of other schools, and I say a couple because that's exactly how many it was, two, um, where we get to the most important part of this. Because ultimately, uh, it's about that shared space. It's going back to that notion of shared space. You're not in there alone. 
it's not yours. Believe it or not, this classroom doesn't belong to you, the teacher. It belongs to all of the people in that classroom, so everybody should have some input. And uh, this was an amazing, amazing group. Uh, it was very cute because of the age of the children, but quite often we, we, we think, well, very young children don't have the ability to, uh, to participate, to offer suggestions, to, uh, to be creative, to plan with you, which is nonsense. Uh, maybe, do you want to maybe talk to this a bit? Yeah, yeah. yes. And, um, usually what we do in cataract is we are full school and we, the, big, the spaces, they are huge uh, spaces in the classroom. This is one, one advantage that we have in our school. The second school that we have the budget to do things. Even if, if sometimes we try to uh, encourage our teachers to be that we use materials from regular to put them in our classroom. So this is another one, another advantage because we don't want just to focus that this is what we have, that if we have the money we can do, if we don't have the money then we cannot do. So this is very important. Another thing is that we are trying as much as we can to put all the students well. They have the, the cost of, they used to have the cost of just putting the Canadian uh, posters, teachers, but now we are moving, especially when we have the implementation of the the academic schools. We don't, we are having the shift from the teachers' work to students' work. And usually what we do, according to the themes, we are modifying our classroom settings. So it is not the same all the time. According, for example, sometimes we delete some learning centers, we create another learning centers. It depends upon how, what we're going to teach. So the, the classroom, it will be just a tool for us to help students learn in a very creative way. So what, what the, and were these KG, pre-KG? Yeah. Three, 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 four KG, from three to five. Yeah. They are almost the same setting yeah. for the early years. So I believe this was three-year-olds uh, that did this. What the teachers did was they, they actually put all the furniture in the middle. So one day the kids came in and the classroom was not what it had been. All the furniture was in the middle. And, uh, of course, this was frustrating for, for younger children who require a lot of routine. We talked about safety, and routine provides that safety. Uh, so all of a sudden, uh, they were faced with an environment that was not the one they were used to anymore. Uh, but they were encouraged to actually take ownership. And this is the very important other piece of the puzzle here, is that I'm not suggesting that you go back to your classroom and redesign your classroom on your own again because you've already designed it. What I want you to do is to actually empower children in some shape or form as much as you see fit and as much as you can depending on your restrictions. Uh, but do not for one minute think that children are not capable of this. I mean this is a very young child uh, who cannot write yet, but they can certainly draw and they will be able to verbalize their ideas. And here are some other examples of what uh, the children's drawings and uh, unfortunately these pictures don't, because it's a picture of a picture, they don't come out too clearly. I had another school in Windhoek uh, which has very limited resources where the teacher actually at the beginning of the school year, the students came and there was nothing in the classroom. There was nothing. The teacher had removed everything and they went through a very similar process where the children became designers and architects. Ultimately what it was, was it was empowering them to partake in that, to invite them to share, uh, to make it their own. And when you have, you know, just imagine your own house, your own wherever you live. Uh, if I came in, I decided how that was and you just had to go there every day, but you had no input. Uh, I put up my photos, I put up what I wanted, even if it is your work, I put it up, I select it. And that's the other thing that you need to consider when you're, uh, when you're uh, uh, putting up work is that it really shouldn't be only what you select. 
Uh, it doesn't have to be the best work. A classroom environment is a working environment. Okay? It's not a museum. Yes, please display the, the good work, but there are other places to do it. It can be outside in the hallways. It can be maybe confined to one wall. But, you know, I think, I think that teachers are far too afraid, uh, maybe worrying that they expose themselves if the perfect piece of work isn't up there which ultimately will give some children or won't give some children the chance ever to have work displayed because it's deemed as not being good. Yeah, I like to think about the first I'm thinking of the skills that uh, students should be developing uh, at very early age, especially all having this decision-making and math skills. Uh, and the ownership and uh, they always make them feel that they are on top of the people and they can make decisions. I like it. And uh, this, this, uh, this activity was as a provocation for for you to keep worrying about space, public space and people. So they, the teacher used this activity just to see what how the students know about people. <laughs> but again, it's, it's providing real, and it's great, if you can embed it into a very realistic learning context, then of course it will be so much more meaningful to the student and it will have so much more depth than if I asked him, you know, to design a space that actually doesn't come to be because it's only on paper uh, or perhaps a model. This is, this is something that provides them with a much, with a much more authentic context. Uh, we need to move on. So the argument is, there are always arguments. I can't, my classroom is too small, there is no budget for extras. I have to meet requirements or regulations. And yet, uh, I challenge you and I say you can. Okay? Work with what you have uh, and that will look very different. Uh, the key factors are try to make the environment as attractive and as, as comfortable to work in. You're not creating a Disneyland in your classroom. Mm -hmm. It's not a play area. It should be a comfortable working environment. Okay? And you can work within your budget. Anything that you add, even if you are in the barest of classrooms, anything you do to, uh, to that and any time you involve the students, it will improve uh, the environment and ultimately the learning. Um, give them equal ownership of that space and let them map and display their learning. So when you're looking at units of inquiry, it should be they who are charting the learning. It should be students who are deciding on what work they would like to see up there. If it's through a unit of inquiry in the PYP, then they should be charting that whole learning process. They're developing understandings as they go along. The last thing you should do is to you know, create a beautiful uh, board and put everything up there because ultimately there isn't very much connection. And it's not just a matter, you know, in most instances I see student work, but it's the teacher who determines what goes up there, where it goes, how it goes up, when it goes up. It's never the students. Give them a whole wall in your classroom that is theirs to display their learning, not for graffiti, but to display their learning. All right, sorry, we need, to, we need to move on because I have a whole other part, uh, which is probably the most important aspect of teaching. Okay? Uh, it's even more important than the physical learning environment and certainly more important, and I don't want to criticize any of my colleagues here, but uh, tools, uh, liter literacy, and the digital uh, age, any of that, it's more important than uh, anything 
uh, else. And that's the emotional environment. Uh, we're going to skip this because we've covered it a bit. But uh, recalling the past, what we tend to do, and I, I, I hopefully you'll agree with me, but what tends to happen is that there will be some teachers we remember, many teachers who we don't. You know, I could not tell you every single teacher I had, but I, w I do remember some, a few teachers because they've impacted me in a, in a certain way. Some because they've decided that I was a victim of the year, and uh, you know, at least I felt like that. Uh, that I was, you know, the person that they wanted to constantly be at. Uh, and those, of course, who were in some shape or form kind to me, or what I perceived to be as a kindness. And thinking of this, you know, this is so powerful, and many people tend to forget that, because teachers are so busy. They are extraordinarily busy, uh, with everything they have to do with all the requirements, the regulations, the meetings, all of that, uh, that they tend to forget students. And this is my categorization, this is not uh, anyone else's, but we have your student and you can give him any name. Basically we have three types of students. In my group one I have that student who's really nice, okay? the one I like, well behaved, always does the work, works hard, is a lovely child for whatever reason. Then I have those in my class. Sometimes it's just one, the one who doesn't listen, the one who just doesn't get it, the one who's disruptive, the one who will never sit down, the one who gets up all the time, and he's a weak student. Okay. And then I have those hmm, that are somewhere in between. Uh, for the most, they go unnoticed because they don't fall into this category or into that category. Sorry? Is that the victims? No, the victim, the victim, I would say, is this person because it's the perception. Now, we flip that around and I, <coughs> I look at it from the child's perspective. And let's say I'm that child who fits into this group. Okay. You know, what, how does my self-esteem develop over, over the years? Teacher A will pass on to teacher B, oh, are you getting so-and-so next year? Oh, boy. You know, uh, next teacher. Oh, he's always been a problem, even in grade one, in grade two as well. That child is branded. That child, for the most, is branded unless there's somebody in their life, a teacher who comes along and tries to find the good in that child, that child becomes branded. Uh, these children will also be branded, but in a much more positive way. Oh, you're getting so and so. What a lovely child. You know? really works hard, very good in school. Okay. And then the rest, the unnoticed ones, because for some reason they conform, but they don't do anything spectacular, but they also don't, uh, they're not distractions either. Ultimately, I don't think that teachers realize the impact that they make on students, okay. especially younger children. For a young child, a very young child, you as a teacher are one of the most important people in their lives. You're almost as important as a parent because they spend so much time with you. And the impact that you have will, it will influence them. It will affect them. Uh, I remember scenes, you know, I go to schools, I remember one scene where there was this teacher who was actually a very good practitioner in the class but then in an informal moment, a three-year-old came up and tugged at her trousers and, and I don't have time. Mm. You know, but it was just a fleeting moment and it wasn't, I know it wasn't something bad, but from the teacher's perspective, but from the child's perspective, uh, to some of them, you are their world, really. I mean, you, you, I think teacher un teachers underrate how much they affect uh, the children in their class. And in the end, above any program, and I'm sorry, uh, Nicole, to say this, uh, but above any program in the world, any, <coughs> any educational system, anything, it is the teachers who cared for us, uh, who really helped us in some, even if it was just a singular thing that they did, 
those are the teachers that impact us and it's all about the quality of relationships that you build with students. Please don't misinterpret that because I'm not telling you to go out and be best friends with your students now. That's not it at all. Um, but you are the most important variable in this education process of children. You have to determine the right balance between being emotionally supportive but also being that person who provides the boundaries and the hierarchy that they need. Otherwise, you know, you, you, it goes to this end, and I've seen that happen. I've seen classes where the teacher was friends with the kids but had absolutely no control. And then I've seen those classrooms where you know, it feels like a military academy for four-year-olds. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's getting to know them. How do you do this? We'll, we'll look at this. But first of all, you know, just go back, and some of you have been teachers for a while now, and it gets to be a bit automatic. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a pattern that repeats itself all the time. You come in, you start the new year, this, you greet the students, and over and over. The students go through that same pattern. But first of all, there are those who face it for the first time. And put yourself in their shoes, what it is like to have that experience, to, to walk into a completely different world, uh, to be exposed to all of this novelty. And in fact, you know, how, do we, how do we help children? And as I was already mentioned, one of the keys is safety. And that safety is something that we seek in our entire lives. We have these apprehensions and they recur and even if you have students who are older, you still need to make those connections. You need to provide that safety for them. If you don't, uh, you're not reaching them. Uh, don't ever think that while well, the student has been in, in school for four years, they know all the routines, uh, I don't need to try to establish those relationships. If you don't, the child won't learn for you. And ultimately, there is no child who does not want to please the teacher. So for the young learner, uh, you provide the, the first weeks of school have to be very simple. You need to establish those routines, um, not to the point where there's no flexibility on, on any parts where you're not going to uh, seize teachable moments, that kind of thing. But also be predictable in inter interactions because if the child knows you and one time you're, you know, you're very gentle and kind with the child and the next time you just uh, send them away then the child doesn't, the child gets confused. <coughs> Be attuned to a student's overload point and this is where a lot of teachers fail. Uh, what happens is that uh, you know, a student may have a bad day, it happens. The teacher still has the same expectations. If you have a, as an adult have a bad day, most likely you'll call in sick. Uh, even if it's not physical or you know there are some ways you just give the students something to work on silent work for a few hours uh, but these are things that you need to be able to recognize is that overload point and you need to find strategies of how to deal with that what you can do to make that student to assist that student in overcoming that to find out the reasons why too Uh, so, again, it's about empowering the learner, uh, encouraging responsibility and reflection uh, to nurture that curiosity that was already mentioned this morning. Uh, and for that to happen, you need to encourage open inquiry opportunities. Do not restrict the learning to structured or guided inquiry. Uh, because this, and this is in the prime years program, this is very much a part of uh, of inquiry-based learning is to have students, student-initiated inquiry. And I see many PYP schools in particular who are good in structured inquiry, uh, guided inquiry, but who fail miserably at student-led inquiry. Plan for the learner first, not the subject matter. Okay, and I, I'll discuss that 
now. Uh, what happens, and again, I think this in part, especially in, in PYP schools, may be a design flaw in the planner itself, but what we do is we sit down to plan a unit. A unit, we plan a unit. We're not planning for a learner to learn, we're planning a unit. And what we do is we plan that unit from beginning to end, and we fill out that planner, uh, and then there is the student. Well, the result of that is that the student fits into the planner, okay? Uh, the student fits into the planner, or we make the student fit into the planner. It's not the planning that accommodates the student, it's the uh, student who, that ac who accommodates the planner. And the problem with that is, of course, that once we, we go through this incredible amount of labor, this incredible amount of work, in planning, and it doesn't need to be only a PYP unit, it can be any planning that you do uh, for lessons. You know, the last thing I'm going to do once I've gone through many hours of work is to make changes. I don't want to. I'm resistant to it because I put so much effort into it already. I'm not going to make a lot of changes, so what happens is I try to fit the learner into the learning rather than fitting rather than accommodating the learner and taking into account the learner and their needs, I'm taking into account my needs or the, the needs of the curriculum and trying to squeeze the learner into that. And that's the problem right there and then. And you will never get authentic inquiry if you do that. It will be contrived. Uh, at the most, you will have guided inquiry, but you're not, you're not going to have the opportunities because you haven't thought of them you haven't built them into the learning to provide that student with uh, opportunities for individual inquiry. So I encourage you, no matter where you are and what you teach, to develop a class profile of the learner. Before you start the planning the, what, what is going to be taught and learned, who are my learners? Take into account their needs, their interests, their talents, and then, after you're ready, after you know them, then that learning can take place. Here's an example, and it's not the definitive example or I, not my suggestion of how to go about it, but this is uh, done by an organization called uh, CAST, the Center of Assistive Technology, uh, and they have something called UDL, Universal Design for Learning. Uh, where they provide uh, some tools uh, to come up with this. But again, this is not the way. This is one way. Uh, but before you plan, you can look at strengths, weaknesses, interests. Uh, and it can be that someone loves gardening or horses. Someone loves computers. Uh, someone really thrives with a lot of structure, uh, weaknesses, distracted, poor writing mechanics any of that. Uh, strengths, uh, computer ways, uh, look at those and then see how you can accommodate some of that in the planning. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we're not done yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, all of that is, is important uh, for you to do. Uh, also, consider relevance. Uh, I see these great units of inquiry happening, great learning, but it's totally irrelevant because a, a, a six-year-old cannot grasp the concept of space. You can have the most engaging, the most fun unit, but there is no depth or quality or meaning. There are no conceptual connections to be made, and you know, apart from making you know, paper mache balls that, and painting them, and making space models, which is something that's a lot of fun, there isn't a real lot of meaning. It's not a context. Children don't have that concept of time. If I say to you 300,000 light years, what does that mean to you? Or, you know, looking at the ancient civilizations. Uh, anyone here learned about ancient Egypt? Yes. About ancient Greece? Yes. Okay, here we go. <laughs> See what you remember, okay? Name the three types of columns uh, that the ancient Greeks had. It was a very important part. So who can name the three type of 
column structures that the ancient Greeks had. Okay. We do a lot of that. We embedded, some call it PYP, but you're still doing the same thing. And it's not something that learners can relate to. Uh, so make sure that you're looking at learning that is meaningful and embedded into context that allows students to make associations. Give them time to think. From very young learners, you're never going to get authentic questions at the beginning of a learning experience because they don't have the experience. They're too young. They, don't, they haven't been exposed to that much. And what you can do is you can sit them down and ask them to ask questions. And they will, that will become a routine ultimately. And they know that in order to please you, they will ask those questions. But they don't have any interest. They're asking those questions because you're telling them to ask questions. Those questions, if there has been depth in that learning, those questions can surface at the end of the unit, sometimes in the middle of the unit, uh, well after the unit. And that's when you know you've been really successful in impacting the learner. But never, or very rarely, at the beginning of the unit. Consider space and time. You know, how many times do you hear not a good listener needs to listen? They need to listen. They need to listen. Well, that's not the way the world works anymore, and you need to take that into account. It's actually you who needs to listen, not the children. They learn in different ways nowadays. They learn in different ways, much different than what it was 10 years ago. So unless you're offering them a variety, you're not going to be able to have the learners sit down uh, and listen to you all day long. And that's still, it's what I said earlier, what has changed is the way that children, the way that teacher presents from uh, much of what I'm doing here. And this is really a bad example. If I had more time with you, we'd do this differently. But, you know, it's, it's moved from just standing there and talking to animated standing there and talking. And I see that especially when I do uh, classroom visits to schools where all of a sudden the teacher becomes much more animated and <laughs> smiles and points to the students, but it is still the teacher talking. Do not speak to a child more than four to eight minutes in one go. It's too long. Uh, provide multiple paths for demonstrating understanding. The assessments that you do should be varied. It doesn't mean you're going to hand out 30 different assessments at the end of a learning experience. It's impractical. But you need to build in the abilities, the preferences, and the needs of the learner in some shape or form at some time during the unit or at least during a spread over a few units. Otherwise, students won't be able to show you their true ability. And I would have loved to share some experiences, but we're running out of time. And above all, make students accountable for their learning. I still walk into many classrooms, uh, you know, a grade one classroom where there's a long lineup to the teacher's desk after we finish the worksheet. Is it good? You know, basically, here you go. If you're doing that, you're not accommodating the learner. You're not preparing them for the, for the next, uh, for their own future. Because I can't go to my boss after I've done a piece of work and say, is it good? You decide, I don't want to think about it because I won't have a job for very long. Okay. Very briefly, uh, UNESCO did a study a while ago. Uh, some comments, not PYP students, children from all over the world, from all different educational systems. Teacher is to the students what the rain is to the field. A good teacher should treat pupil like his own children. I think that's very profound coming from an 11-year-old. Okay? Uh, answers the needs of pupils. You not only teach children, but you have to learn from them. Okay? It's reciprocal. How do you go about it? Again, assess your role in the classroom. Be cognitive of your interactions. And this is a challenge because you have so much to do during the day. Be in tune to your students. We all have our good days and our bad days, and consider that. Uh, take time to discover each individual, however best you can. 
if you don't know anything about the child, uh, you're not creating a connection. Embrace different personalities, don't crush them. So if you have someone who's active, who likes to talk, uh, you need to embrace that personality. People have different personalities. Uh, just imagine if you were put into a place where you had to conform or you were in trouble. You know, if your personality were so stifled that you couldn't express yourself. Cater to different interests as much as is realistic. If the child has specific interests, try to build that in at some point, somehow. Uh, plan for engaging in relevant learning and basically just be human. Okay. Don't try to be an authoritarian, be human. Okay. Key factors, reach out to the individual and empower the learner. Okay. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All the best. Uh,